Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. I want to turn to the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. The World Food Program observed that half the children under five are acutely malnourished in the country, that 14 million uh, individuals in Afghanistan are on the brink of starvation, that 31 or 34 provinces are at risk of losing their health services entirely, and that 1% of the country is vaccinated. Uh, do you, uh, this is a fairly accurate description of the, the challenge for both uh, food and for health care? It is. The humanitarian situation is dire. Thank you. And the U.S. just participated in an international conference in which $1.1 billion was pledged in humanitarian relief from a variety of, of nations, including an additional uh, commitment by the United States. But uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that often are essential for providing aid, are very concerned about a legal pathway to do so. Because in 2002, the Taliban was listed as a specially designated global terrorist organization under the International Economic Emergency Powers Act, and it doesn't have a humanitarian exception. Uh, previously, where we face this situation in, in Yemen, the Treasury Department stepped in to create a, a legal pathway, and uh, a number of senators uh, have written uh, to uh, Secretary Yellen and with copies uh, to you and to Samantha Powers saying let's use that same pathway here in which the Office of Foreign Asset Controls issues a general license creating kind of legal insulation providing humanitarian assistance. Um, Will, are you engaged in a conversation about how to create a legal pathway to provide humanitarian assistance? Uh, yes, we are. We've, we've issued one initial license, as you know. Uh, the Treasury issued uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, and we're looking at what other authorities uh, might be needed to make sure that humanitarian assistance can flow uh, as, best, uh, as best possible in Afghanistan. Great. Thank you. That's absolutely essential. And I think we, we have a significant responsibility. We have the, the chaos of, of, of war in combination with the, the pandemic. Uh, and general disruption in the country and, and uh, its immoral responsibility to provide assistance. I'm going to ask to enter for the, to the record the letter from September 2nd that the senators and members of the House sent to the administration. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, so as provincial capitals started to, to fall, and we had nine provincial capitals fall in six days, there was a lot of discussion about whether the government of Afghanistan would direct a reconsolidation of forces uh, to uh, essentially consolidate protection of the territory it still held, which was a, a shrinking. Did, did the government of Afghanistan take key strategic military decisions to consolidate its, its forces? It did not, and this was a source of tremendous frustration across the uh, administration from the uh, president uh, on down as the summer uh, went on and uh, we saw the, uh, the Taliban uh, moving across the country. Uh, we repeatedly pressed the, uh, the Afghan government to do just what you described, which is to consolidate its forces and to defend what was uh, essential to defend uh, and what could be defended, not to extend itself across the entire country, which it didn't uh, have the, uh, the full capacity to do. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that consolidation uh, and the, uh, the, the plan that we urged on them uh, for how to effectively defend uh, the, uh, the major cities uh, never took shape. What was the response of the of the of the government or from Ash, President Ashraf Ghani about uh, why they chose not to consolidate their forces to protect the areas they controlled? Well, in in uh, at different moments there were different responses. At some point, I think initially, uh, the response was, "Oh, we can't uh, we can't be seen to be gi giving up on any part of the uh, the country." <laughs> never mind that, you know, over the last uh, five or six years, uh, the amount of the 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 Part, the, the part of the country by population controlled by the government of Afghanistan, if you go back to 2014, 2015, uh, went from about 60% uh, to, at the, at the end of last year, uh, about, uh, about 48%. So this was, in, this was happening, at, uh, to some extent, outside the cities, of course, um, relentlessly, slowly but relentlessly. Uh, but then, uh, as we pressed and pressed and pressed uh, on them, the response was, yes, uh, we'll do it, but they didn't. Well, we have seen over a number of years, we had the um, uh, challenge of uh, elections that were considered uh, illegitimate by a portion of the country. We had Abdullah Abdullah and uh, 
Ashraf Ghani kind of facing off against each other and creating paralysis, great difficulty appointing key ministers to key positions. As we analyze and try to understand the, the rapid collapse, did the, 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 was there essentially a failure to create an effective decision-making capability within the Afghanistan government? I think there are a number of factors, and this is something that uh, I, I hope we all look at going back uh, really over the last over the last 20 years uh, and various key points. Uh, certainly, there was a lack of unity uh, in in the government because it, it, it was comprised of different uh, different groups, different factions, uh, and despite again uh, very significant efforts to get them to act in a unified way, they couldn't or wouldn't. Uh, second, uh, I think uh, in terms of their uh, effectiveness. There are obviously serious concerns uh, that manifested themselves. Uh, and third, one of the endemic problems that uh, we've had over the last 20 years that we've not been able to effectively address uh, is pervasive corruption. And that has so many consequences. One of the consequences, uh, though, is that uh, if you're being asked to, uh, to fight and put your life on the line uh, for a government or for an institution uh, that's corrupt, that's a pretty hard uh, decision to make. And so I think, um, as we saw, with many uh, Afghan forces, uh, soldiers fighting very, very bravely and giving their lives, but institutionally, the military collapsed in totally unanticipated ways in the course of 11 days. I think as we go back and look, one of the things we have to look at is the uh, impact that this pervasive corruption had in terms of uh, giving uh, the, the institution the will uh, to, uh, to fight for the country. Absolutely. In those uh, uh, final days, as the provincial capitals were falling, uh, President Ghani refused to acknowledge uh, that there were falling capitals. It was almost like a, a, a world in which he was uh, disengaged. And then the finance minister resigned and said he was leaving the country for family reasons, but it was taken as a symbol of, of the government on the verge of collapse. And then shortly thereafter, President Ghani uh, fled himself. I think it was August 15th, Sunday, August 15th. And uh, did we have forewarning of this uh, beginning of the cabinet to essentially uh, flee the country? And how did we respond uh, to that? Uh, we did not. On Saturday, as it happens, um, I spoke to President Ghani. Uh, we were working on a, uh, on a plan to have uh, a transfer of power to a uh, Taliban-led but but more broadly representative government to include um, many of the different actors in Afghanistan working on that in Doha. Uh, I was uh, calling President Ghani to make sure that he would support that. Uh, that was critical. He told me he would, but he said if the Taliban wouldn't go ahead with it, he would, and I'm paraphrasing here, fight to the death. That was Saturday. He left Afghanistan the next day on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the uh, awareness of senators, there is a vote going on. There's a subsequent vote going on as well. It's my intention to try to uh, continue through the process 